the body. <laughs> Our blood pumps turn at 350 mils a minute. So there's a lot of blood coming out and going back in in order to filter it properly. And you need a central vein or a fistula in order to get enough blood out and return it and clean it effectively. Um, so that's why we can't just, you know, stick it into an IV. So what do you know about fistulas? I don't want to teach anyone to suck eggs. <laughs> don't. We don't know enough. So don't know enough? Yeah. Take care of them. So. Take care of them? Excellent. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, don't take a blood pressure on that arm. <laughs> it does. Go the leg or they'll know where you can take it. Sometimes the old one's been tied off and you can actually take a blood pressure on an old arm, but it's the one with the brewy and the thrill in it that you don't want to take the blood pressure on. Um, so fistula is a surgical joining of an artery and a vein. Potential potential danger for our clients here too. Um, the diversion of the arterial blood flow, veins and arteries are made of similar stuff, yeah? So you do a small small incision and join the two vessels together. The arterial blood then surges back up through the vein and the vein enlarges in order to accommodate the higher flows and the higher pressure. Um, you can then access enough blood to filter it properly. It's usually on the non-dominant arm and it's named after the vessels that we use to create it. So you've got brachiobacillics, brachiocephalics, and radiocephalic fistulas. When we're describing the fistula, you shouldn't just say left AVF, you should actually specify if it's radio, radiocephalics are down here. Brachiobacillics tend to sit up inside the arm. Oh, sorry, brachiobacillics inside the arm. Brachiocephalics down along the outside of the upper arm. I talked about pump speeds at 350, 400 mils a minute. Is that why they're like, lumpy? Because they get very large? I'll get to that, yeah. yeah. They shouldn't be lumpy. They shouldn't be lumpy. <laughs> they all are lumpy. It's the pain I'm really passionate about. Like I said, I was an access nurse for a while. It drives me mental. They shouldn't be lumpy. Um, <laughs> yeah, so usually on the non-dominant arm. Now, you saw our catchment area. Yeah, huge. We have one vascular surgeon in the Northern Territory. Has anyone met Mr. Hamilton before? No? Mark, yeah? He's funny. <laughs> He's lovely. He's very, very precious about sticking IVCs into cephalic vessels <laughs> on renal patients, stages one through five. We get, we get told off on the renal ward if he finds any IVCs down, he like down here on the inside of the arm. Cubital fossa too will damage the cephalic for fistula creation later. So like I say, you get five to seven years out of a fistula and your fistula is your patient's lifeline. So you imagine if you've got, if you've had repeated IVCs, venipunctures in here, in, in both arms, generally that rules out your radiocephalic and you've got to start from your brachiocephalic vessel or creation. Um, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30, 35 years, you're living a long time on that machine, yeah? But if you're starting here, you're cutting off at 5, 10, you know, 15, 20. It's really important that we preserve those vessels for people to survive a long time on the machine. This is what one without bumps should look like, yeah? It's one of my favourite clients. He was our first buttonhole technique in the whole of Alice. But this was his first buttonhole. So he had good good fistula management, yeah. So the nature of Alice Springs, transient staff, yeah. Um, dialysis is very tricky to develop skill at. It's not something that you do for five minutes and you're good at. It's something that you need at least 12 months to consolidate your training before you can manage all the complications. Uh, it's, it's not an easy thing. So what should happen? This is an AV graft. I don't know if you can see that very well, but it's what we call a loop graft. So that's where there weren't, we have advanced peripheral vascular disease and when the surgeons had a look at this, he's, he's not found any blood vessels that are suitable for fistula creation. So he's used a piece of plastic instead to join the artery and the vein together that you can then cannulate. Rope ladder technique is how you can you, how you put your needles into the fistula or graft. So ideally, it should be like a ladder. Needle one, needle two. 
Yeah? Then next time you come in, needle one, needle two. Then next time you come in, needle one, needle two. Then we're going to rotate it down here. Needle one, needle two. And, and you stagger it up and move your needles around. Yeah? And in that way, the fistula grows nice and even. You've all put in IVs before, I'm assuming, yeah? Um, so you're told, you have a, look at, have a look at your IV, find a nice straight section of the, you know, when you're selecting your site. Problem is blood vessels often don't have, they're not shaped nice and straight, they go all the way down your arm. There are curves and there are twists and there are little, you know, idiosyncrasies that happen. So there may be only two sections of the fistula that are nice straight sections to get your needles in. And repeated needling of the same site is what causes those big blowouts. Incidentally, those aneurysms are exactly the length of the dialysis needle, if you look at them. So what you end up with if you do what we call repeated site technique is this, yeah, area needling. So the nurses are popping the needle in there and in there every time the patient dialyzes. And what happens is that area weakens and it, it becomes a big bubble on the patient's arm. Now, it's not necessarily bad nursing care that causes this, <laughs> okay? If you've ever stuck needles in a renal patient, um, patients, it's that giant needle. It is the biggest needle I've ever seen. You need local before you get the needle put in most cases. And you don't want to be a pin cushion. When you're already getting stuck three times a week, you know, you don't want some young junior nurse coming along and missing three times before they hit your site. So patients know where their nice straight section is and they'll often insist that you put their, no, you, you'll try and use the fistula up here and try and do that nice technique and try and make the progression. The patient will just refuse outright. So no, you put it in here, then you'll get it. And if you don't, you don't know what you're doing. So part of my mission in life is educating people on first treatment. <laughs> Those sites need to be rotated. And so we don't end up with this. There's there's six to eight hundred mils of blood a minute flowing through anybody's fistula at any given time. And we do have issues with heparinization. I can't see the time. How am I going? Eleven? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you're you just give me a five minutes to yeah, go. Sure. Yeah, and I'll flick it on. Um, yeah, so we we use heparin or clexane on the machines to stop the blood from going hard while we're filtering it and to stop residual blood being left in the circuit. But people are often anticoagulated. They're often on aspirin also to prevent, you know, cardiovascular complications coming on. And they have these lovely weakened areas on their fistula. So you come home from dialysis, you know, you have a nice big cough and blow that clot off, you're going to have arterial blood flow. Just like a horror movie spurting from the carotid, but spurting from the, um, from the fistula. It's actually a running joke in dialysis nurse circles. I have a shirt at home that says dialysis nurse and just has blood splatters across the front of it. <laughs> because there's so much blood that's flowing around a dialysis unit. And I think underneath it says saving the world in mils a minute. <laughs> Making a difference in mils a minute. There's lots of blood flowing around. The other thing that amazes me is the like you teach clients. If that happens, you apply pinpoint pressure to that exit site. Hold it for five minutes. You can elevate the arm. The bleeding will stop generally. If it doesn't, you can suture it. You know, keep the pressure on until they get to hospital and suture it. But the amount of clients that will have a cloth and a cough or start rebleeding after a session and come back in going, sister, this big blood trail behind them. <laughs> oh, infection control. No, hold it, hold it. <laughs> so that's rebleeding. Yeah, where we put the needles in, like I say, they're big needles, you can have a re-bleed, little spurt, pressure on for five to ten minutes, it'll sort itself out usually. Depending on blood pressure and things like that, I have had to hold a site for 45 minutes on one person before it would stop. But if you keep sitting there hanging onto it, check it every five minutes, don't lift it every two seconds, wear goggles when you do that because you don't want to spurt in your eye, it will arrest. The other thing that can go wrong is these aneurysms can burst, yeah, and that's life-threatening medical emergency. If someone calls an ambulance when one of these is burst, you probably won't make it 
yeah, it, they'll bleed to death very, very quickly. But if you come across someone or if one bursts in the ambulance or something, you um, full pressure higher up the artery and remember it's an artery. Yeah, don't treat it like it's a vein because you'll get that huge blood flow. We caught one that exploded on the renal ward and saved the person. It was re <laughs> really good management. Really tight blood pressure cuffs too can arrest that bleeding if nothing else will work. Tourniquet. Yeah. So we have signs to say, you know, on the bedside in the hospital to say, don't do these things. So our care recommendations, no blood pressure on the fistula arm. No bloods from the fistula arm except at dialysis. We don't access the central line for antibiotics or for bloods. However, in a life-saving situation where you cannot get any other IV access, you're not going to let a patient with a CVAD die because you can't get IV access. So please be aware that those lines are locked with heparin and citrate and you have to aspirate five mils from them before you put anything down them. All right. Um, no pick lines in the non-dominant arm. We like to preserve the non-dominant arm as much as we can. And yeah, preserve the cubital fossa. So if you're putting an IVC in, the ideal place is hands and feet. It's a lot trickier than it sounds though with peripheral vascular disease in our clients. Yeah. So we like to we like to try for that, but you know, you can only do what you can do. Be aware of mapping and planned fistulas and avoid the non-dominant arm as a general rule. And I like to talk about that fistula first initiative. So in 2003, the whole nephrology community worldwide found, especially in America where the whole health system is based on insurance, what was happening is it was a lot quicker and cheaper to put a central line in someone for dialysis, despite the, the impact on the patient's prognosis and all the clinical evidence. In America, about 90, 90, 80 to 90% of their dialysis patients were dialyzing through central lines. Fistula creation is an elective procedure too, so it can be a bit of a wait to get your fistula created. People in Alice are really lucky because there are two spots for fistula creation every week. And Dr. Jacob makes sure that, that he knows what a problem renal disease is and makes time for those creations and prioritizes them, but it's not the same everywhere else. Um, so we had this push, yeah, and the whole nephrology community said, right, by in 2003, we want to have 60% of all our clients dialyzing through fistulas. Yeah? We want to have this huge push towards fistula usage. In Alice, we're at 95%, so we're highest rates in the country of people dialyzing through fistulas. Coincidentally, longest survival of any renal, which is like the antithesis of everything you're taught, but we have the longest surviving patient demographic too. Um, I think that's because they come on the machine earlier and getting renal disease a bit younger. And because of those great support services like Purple House that are around. So you can get them in some unusual places too. Once you run out of access options, Dr. Hamilton gets very inventive. <laughs> so you can have femoral AVFs, femoral fistulas, femoral grafts, loop grafts where native vessels aren't suitable, and that's a picture of a loop graft. Um, I even have two patients with collar grafts that go along here. And then interventional nephrology to salvage fistulas. So things that can go wrong, we've got bleeding. I'll, I'll go into that. But you've also got clotting off. So if you feel and there's no Bruin thrill, strongly recommend that patient goes to hospital. Through vibration or thrill, it means that you're probably clotting off or there's something really wrong. So go to hospital. Um, stenosis or narrowing of the, of the blood vessel can lead to swelling of the fistula arm, the shoulder, and can actually, I've seen it go into the entire breast, the, lady ends up with a big one side Dolly Parton. Um, that one we might, it depends, it depends, it's a lifeline. If fixing this stenosis is more dangerous than, you know, uh, yeah. sometimes they'll be fixed, sometimes they'll be let to go. Burst fistulas with that medical emergency and leaking from the sites. So yeah, pinpoint pressure to that needle exit site our central lines. I like that as for my hospital staff, yeah, blue and <laughs> red and blue, not for you. They're different, <laughs> they're different from long-term central lines. Two types of lines you'll get out there. There's the temporary line, which lasts five to seven days. 
they might stretch that out if they're waiting for a tunneled line insertion. Um, but different to long-term antibiotic lines in that they've only got two lumen. The lumen are fatter and they're red and blue for arterial and, and venous blood. Um, the difference between them, these ones don't have a Dacron cuff. The long-term tunneled lines do. So a long-term tunneled line lasts on average about a year. Um, and the tissue sort of heals in around the Dacron and that's what creates a seal and makes it a bit, a bit better. I have seen one last seven years. So it depends on how you care for them. And they sit directly in the right atrium of the heart. They go through the superior vena cava. What's that mean? What do you think any time you think of a central line? Sepsis potential. <laughs> so check the temperature when you pick those clients up too, especially if they have a line. They might be septic if they've got no blood pressure and they're shaky and stuff. Straight to hospital. That's just about that Dacron cuff. Ah, so fluid issues. Huge difference with non-adherence to fluid restriction recommendations. We have a bit of an ethical dilemma there in that patients do have a right to refuse. Yeah. So it drives, drives my poor nurses on the ward crazy because they'll have this patient they're caring for with an 800 mil fluid restriction who'll hit them up for 12 cups of tea in a day, you know, and they go, oh, what do I do? Do I give it? Do I not give it? <laughs> Said, so, no, you educate the patient about the damage that that's going to cause if they choose to have that drink, but ultimately what they're going to put in their mouth is up to them. And they do have a right to say, no, stuff it, and to drink what they want to drink. Five to 800 mils a day. We don't have jugs in their rooms. We give them small cups with it, like little half cups to take their tablets with. This flabbergasts me too. I need about, you know, <laughs> about a cup and a half to take half a Panadol, but these guys can throw back a whole handful of meds with this tiny little splash of water. Um, and fluid restricted and dialysis diets in the hospital. So like I said, includes the water content in jelly, rice, custard, ice cream, pasta. I put this in because we're going to talk a little bit about hyperkalemia and people often think bananas when you say hyperkalemia. Yeah? <laughs> no, I know. Bananas are a really high so um, potential source of potassium, but they're not what make causes the hyperkalemia in our clients. It's far more drinking citrus juices, orange, grapefruit, prune or tomato juice that have high potassium contents that catches out the clients. And just to remember that what goes in stays in. So you can have really big loads. Big loads. Kapi pulka. Yeah, that's pit and jarra, not arinda. I apologise. But they, like I say, we cross five borders and they're the old ladies that taught me my little bits of language. Um, hypertension is the first thing that we see. Potential for left ventricular hypertrophy. Edema. Pulmonary edema. Like once we've leaked into those edematous spaces... If you're assessing a patient for fluid in the territory, our Indigenous clients don't tend to carry the fluid in their ankles. Yeah, If I get a bit of edema, straight to the ankles, end up with elephant feet, it tends to hide in the sacrum and in the face a lot more in our clients. So you'll see like intraocular swelling, which normally comes much later. Um, and yeah, a lot of it around the midsection. Yeah. <coughs> Dietary restrictions. <laughs> your potassium restricted, your sodium restricted, your um, phosphate restricted. You don't want to eat too much protein because that's going to create more creatinine. My head of nephrology gave this talk once and said, so basically if you take out everything that has these things in it, you're left with an empty plate. <laughs> You've got nothing to eat. So it's about minimising that sort of intake. Um, fluid restriction, hyperkalemia with misdialysis and non-adherence to potassium restrictions are big issues for us. The best way to go is to be cared for in a hostel because they'll provide you meals and then you won't have to worry and they'll be s relatively suitable. A little, a little spot on sugar, yeah, because we said diabetes is our leading cause of renal disease. Um, check the blood glucose level if you see changes to the level of consciousness because it could be DDS or some sort of disequilibrium. It could be uremia because when people are extremely uremic, it affects their short-term memory and their cognitive function. Or it could be that they're hypo or hyper. Um, and we just want to find what the cause is. 
multiple factors that can impact that blood glucose in our renal clients, um, adherence to treatment. There's glucose in your dialysate. So your extremely non-compliant patient who, you know, comes in with blood sugars of 24, put them on the machine, they'll come off with a blood sugar of 17. You'll actually equilibrate them a little bit, not down to normal range, but you stabilize blood sugars in your absolute non-compliant patients a little bit. The other innovation that the renal team here has come up with, <laughs> glargine became available, didn't it? Which is a basal insulin that works for 24 to 48 hours. So your patients who you'd prescribe, you know, um, Novomix and things like that for, that would then go home and not inject themselves, well, we can actually do observed therapies by giving them big doses of glargine three times a week, and that leads to diabetic control too, if they show up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> peritoneal dialysis has a huge impact on sugars, yeah, as it uses sugar in order to suck fluid out of the uh, out of the peritoneum. So you often find sugars are all over the shop when people are starting on PD. There's a loss of appetite if you're remix, so if you're not eating, that can make an impact. And then there are food security issues for our clients too. So do they even have food to eat? Um, Little overview on medications. We have <laughs> lots of polypharmacy. Yeah, like I say, a big handful of tablets. Some of the common things people are on are antihypertensives, erythroproietin stimulating agents like Eprex and um, Aranesp and Mucera. They stimulate red blood cell production in the bone marrow. Okay, kidneys produce a hormone that does that, so when they don't work, you have to have that hormone injected three times a week. Oh. Now you can have it once a month, not three times a week. So we keep adding extra protein chains and giving it a longer half-life. Phosphate binders with food in order to keep the phosphate down and prevent renal bone disease long-term. Iron, because patients are often iron deficient and their iron uptake's different. Calcitriol, which is the active form of vitamin D, another hormonal function of the kidney that we're replacing. And then B, C, and folate are water-soluble vitamins that we strip from the blood every time we dialyze someone. So we put them back in after the treatment. In the early stages, you might see big doses of diuretics, which can have an impact on potassium as well. I might skip that because I know we're running out of time. They're just little overviews of those medications. Scans with contrast we avoid too because they can knock off residual renal function. We need to plan dialysis if scans are... Uh, for people. This one's for you though. Clinical handover should include the patient's renal vital signs, any meds they've received, any medications not given with rationale for why they weren't, recent treatments, recent tests, patient's condition and any other patient pertinent information including any bleeding. We have an early warning system in the hospital so we like that to be up to date too if you're going to hand over to us in the renal unit. And then back the other way, um, we should be handing over the weight loss post and interdialytic observations and complications and any um, changes in the condition that may alter ward requirements. I'm sorry, I know I'm over time, I'm speeding up. Any appointments we make for these clients, we need to work around their dialysis days. Yeah, so you don't book them something on a day where they're due to show up for the treatment. Two types of PD, there's an automated peritoneal dialysis system where you hook up to a machine at night and it does all your exchanges or you can do manual exchanges with PD. So that's you connect up four times a day and run out all the effluent that's in your peritoneum and run in nice clean fluid. Um, fluid restrictions a litre to a litre and a half depending on your renal function. There's a huge stigma with PD in the centre. So often you'll give treatment options to people, they'll say, oh, PD sounds great. Go home, talk to family, come back and say, no, those bags kill you. Um, we don't have a very good uptake, three patients on PD. But they're doing very well. <laughs> so they don't have high incidence of peritonitis and things, unfortunately. So PD uses your own peritoneal membrane to dialyse. You're in contact, that membrane's really vascular, and you're washing fluids in contact with that for four hours, and then you drain out all the junk later. Looks just like urine. If someone's a PD patient, biggest risk is peritonitis. So if they're febrile or if they have cloudy effluent, straight to hospital. That's a medical emergency too. So your peritoneum surrounds all your vital organs. 
and an infection in there is not good. We also like to avoid constipation because the bowel is really close to the peritoneum and microbes can sort of infect the patient in that manner. Yep. CKD, they may have fistulas, they may have erythrostimulating um, agents. We weigh them on admission and refer them to the renal team. In transplant, there's no fluid restriction because their kidney's working. Yay! No daily diet required. They may also have what we call a spare tire fistula. Yeah, so it's just in case the kidney breaks down, we can pull it out. We don't have to worry about central lines. A lot of PD patients have that too. They can't miss their medicines. Frequent blood tests are really important and they're all immunosuppressed, so keeping them away from infected people. My key messages I want you to take away for primary health, guys. Preventing renal disease is easy. It's general healthy lifestyle stuff. So it's things like controlling your blood pressure. If you're diabetic, controlling your HbA1c. Visiting your GP regularly. Starting antihypertensives if you become hypertensive. And then making health, healthy lifestyle choices like regular exercise, smoking cessation, and excess weight reduction. Messages you can give to anyone who's in stages one to five that will significantly slow their progression if they choose to take them. What's it mean for you guys? Potential issues to rule out hyperkalemia, pulmonary edema, missed dialysis, and sepsis, I think, are the big ones. Um, and we talked about the reasons for those. Hyper or hypoglycemia, so check that blood glucose. And I just want to mention drinking on dialysis. It's not really common, but it does happen. And it's dangerous to dialyze someone who's drunk. Alcohol dialyzes off. So you rip that alcohol out of their body really quickly and they sober up really fast on the machine. Um, so if you think that someone's been drinking blood tests or blood alcohol, um, it's good. Yeah? They were our learning objectives revisited. So in conclusion, five stages of CKD are determined by GFR. We have the highest incidence in the Northern Territory. Modality options are hemo, peritoneal, transplant or palliation. At-risk cares include fluid administration, administration of post-dialysis meds inappropriately, access mismanagement, and care fragmentation between teams. So it's important we have these sort of days. Um, increased risk of complications with missed HD and those primary health messages. Yeah. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Oh. oh, wait, don't go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yep, go. Oh, sorry, it was just around um, um, transplant patients in the Indigenous. Is that common and is it something that they're open to discussion about? They are. We have 36 transplanted clients in, in, in Alice that are managed by our transplant team. And last year we had more transplants than ever before because we've got a second nurse on. So we're working people up a bit more. A lot of the time comorbidities rule people out for transplant or sadly non-compliance rules people out for transplant. But yeah, we do have a, a, a quite a few active transplant patients waiting for the call to get a kidney. And then there's... Notice there's always so much... Um, They'll take a kidney. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take a kidney, thanks. If you've got one to give. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The best, it's the best treatment option. If you've got to come into dialysis three times a week, it eats your whole life up. So taking, taking tablets instead at home, much better than getting your bloods taken. Yeah. Does anybody else have a question? Jess? Yeah, great, mate. Um, with... Dialysis, like the satellite dialysis centres, we often get called because a patient develops hypertension during treatment. Yeah. Is there a reason why they get stopped and taken to KDU? They can stroke out if their blood pressure is too high, mm -hmm. especially if they're heparinized. Is there a set limit? Anything pressure? systolic over 200, I would want to be dialysing in the sending patient. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you do have, depending on the fluid load and depending on whether people are compliant with antihypertensives. I had one lady whose routine blood pressure was 220 on 110. You couldn't move it. And she was on maximum doses of all the antihypertensives she could have. Um, 
but yeah, there's that potential for the bleed when you heparinize someone, and we'd just far rather err on the side of caution and keep them in the inpatient setting where there's crash teams around and things if we're worried about that risk. Anyone? Mm -hmm. Good one. Anyone else? You'd look at the deviation from the patient's baseline to not necessarily set a standard 200. Like if your patient normally set 110 and they came in at 180, you might think, hang on a minute, that's really unusual for them. So we'll get things like they're going at 130 and get to 160 and then we take them to hospital. We can't hope any dialysis, so I don't know if I'm just Transient stuff. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> of course. A lot of time, a lot of time to develop dialysis expertise. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, if you, yeah. again, if you come from the East Coast and you're not used to seeing these big fluid loads or, you know, maybe don't understand that patient's pattern, um, better to err on the side of caution and ship them out. Yeah. I was going to ask you about uh, urine output. So if they're CKD 4 or 5, at what stage do they stop producing any, you know, void or urine output? Um, I can't give you a definitive yeah. answer to that one. I'm yeah. sorry, or I would. Yeah. Um, some, you know, so a lot of the time we'll be pumping diuretics into them and mm. trying to get some voiding happening. Mm. But yeah, once, once that, it's a combination of things. So it's when you actually do cease voiding. When you start dialysis, you knock off residual renal function too. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm far u more used to dealing with people that are in CKD5 that don't void than those, those early stages. Because, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, like I'd, I've definitely found with that that people that have missed more than one or two dialysis usually still have urine mm. output. And they can tolerate it more. Because they can right. tolerate right. it better. Yeah, like, yeah they don't know, become yeah. symptomatic as like, easily. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah, But what you'll find is over time their creatinine will still climb, oh, even like though that. they can void. Yeah. So they're not cleaning there are, It's not actually, yeah. yeah. And, okay. and I often see that uremic frost on a lot of our indigenous patients. Yeah. You know, their, their skin will be very sort of, you know, shiny and, you know, it's quite, quite interesting. Mm. Mm. Is that more uh, because of the demographic? Do you see that in your more Caucasian um, clientele as well? Or? I honestly, I've been here since I was a, a new grad, so I haven't dialyzed yeah, too okay. many Caucasian people. I have about three Caucasian patients that yeah, I've yeah. looked after yeah, really specific. Um, over time. Yeah. Don't tend to, I don't notice it as much. It doesn't stand out on the, on the fair skin yeah, in, in yeah. such a way as it does in the, yeah. in the indigenous skin. Awesome. All right. Anybody? Okay. Anybody else? Sorry. Who? Oh, yep. Yeah. Hang on. Just, yep, just touch on the scabies issue. You yep. said, is it scabies and clean teeth and that sort of stuff? I've heard that. If we can just clear that up, you would We'd reduce, reduce it. so much of this. Is that it right? It would certainly help. Yeah, I won't say it won't. <laughs> yeah. um, I'd, I, and if we if we could have healthy eating too. If you look at the stuff that comes out of, of community um, stores and what people are buying out there mm -hmm. and what's available that's fresh, you know, you're getting far more people buying Coca-Cola and, you know, um, those tin pies and things mm -hmm. like that that are all, you know, high in salt and yes. what we call those non-nutrient dense foods that just fill you up but don't, don't really give, give you any good substance. Mm -hmm. It's leading to those non non insulin dependent diabetic incidents, which is a real shame. It's a fully preventable chronic disease, <laughs> you know. That you could, if if we could change those social determinants of health, we could make a huge impact. Or I'd like to see. I know this is going to be really controversial, and to put it out there though, a sugar and fat tax on food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how you that's how you fix it. If it cost more to buy Maccas than it did to buy fresh food <laughs> and, <laughs> and good food for you, it's then you'd so be right. It's just so cheap, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. No? Yeah, I don't know. It's not Sorry, looking I'm feeding to your time a little bit. No. My apologies. Just, and just to confirm, uh, with our direction about uh, getting access in an emergency situation, that we could use the fistula, obviously, uh, if it was a you know, life-threatening emergency to... If it's life-threatening, you yeah. could, yeah. But just be aware it's arterial blood, yeah. so... Yeah, a lot of pressure behind it, obviously. A lot of yeah. pressure. <laughs> I just have images yeah. in my head. Yeah. I just think, oh, no, yeah. don't yeah. do something. You don't know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. put an IVC in if you can get it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was far more... Uh, rather than accessing the fistula, that was far more to do with the central line. Sure. If there's a CVAD in place. Uh, 
I mean, I'm dialysis trained and I've, I've done it. I had a met call from the board just last week where they couldn't get IV access and I just ran and got a fistula needle and stuck it in. Yeah. Ideally, if you're picking someone up from a dialysis unit, they should leave one needle in for you. Yeah. They actually yeah. never do. Never. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. I think they get the patient all nice and packaged and ready yeah. and then they call us, which is frustrating. Because our direction's always been, you know, in that emergency situation, you look for like a, you know, a line, obviously, if you can, or go, we go straight to IO. I you know, yeah. on a, on the arm, um, obviously, it doesn't have the fistula or, or the leg. Um, Probably IO before fistula. Yeah. But I'd say yeah. CVAD before. Uh, yeah, CVAD before IO. Yeah, well, then what, yeah. And IO is a problem too because you've got all these renal bone disease happening. Yeah. yeah. Not suitable yeah. bone for yeah. absorption. And I don't think a lot of us are very familiar with central lines, like happen to aspirate. You know. Yeah. You know, a lot of us probably. Yeah, leave it alone. Familiar then. with that. Or maybe. Yeah. That, or we'd yeah, need like specialised training maybe yeah. from the service, like bringing it in yeah. as something that, yep, okay, yeah. we are cool for you to do this yeah, sort exactly, of thing. Yeah. And I'm sure the nephrologist wouldn't be happy with me training. <laughs> yeah, yeah, getting that sort of access yeah. those. Yeah. I'd be shocked. Yeah. Anything <laughs> from <laughs> online? All right, yeah. perfect. All right, all right, are we all good, everyone? Yeah. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Thank you. <laughs>